How are stocks behaving in this big market sell-offs and are ETFs the disaster that we were warned about? Let's talk to Dave Nodick and find out. Hey, Dave, we talked earlier about how uh, squirrely the bond market has gotten relative to uh, what's been going on. How do things look in the trading of equity markets and how have stock ETFs been holding up? Well, you know, they've, they're they really just doing perfectly in the sense that we haven't had any big disconnects. We haven't had any trading hiccups that I've been able to see. I think a lot of people were worried about, quote unquote, flash crashes, where we'd end up with, you know, prices that end up way off, you know, 90% off fair value, which we sort of saw back in 2010. We really haven't had an example since 2010, since uh, the exchanges changed the the circuit breaker rules. If we were going to have had a hiccup, it would have been around the circuit breakers that kicked off on the worst couple of days. I think we had three days maybe when the circuit breakers kicked in. The reason that can be an issue is because when everything closes, that means now, you know, at 1030 in the morning or whatever, we now have to reopen all of those individual securities and their rules and processes about doing that. Every individual security that gets halted has its own way of reopening in terms of like how the opening auction works based on where it's listed. Now, they're pretty synchronized, but the point is it was a real test of the infrastructure to keep opening and closing not only ETFs, but the whole market at the same time. And for the most part, we really didn't get any hiccups that I was able to find. So that's great. We've seen a ton of flows. I think that's the other message. We have seen just enormous flows in and out of various equity ETFs, really, I think, as you would expect, right? I mean, energy, right? Energy ETFs have had big inflow days, big outflow days. Um, we've seen reallocations just inside things like large cap equity. It's, it was a brutal quarter for, say, SPY, which everybody knows. It lost like $18 billion in net flows out. But those all showed up into things like VOO, the cheaper version from Vanguard, or IVV, the cheaper version from iShares. So people have definitely used this as an opportunity to do some reallocation. Maybe they were able to avoid some taxes that they had embedded. Uh, but overall, we've seen just ETFs be the dominant way of expressing people's opinions. We've seen like something like 45% of the dollar volume on the market during the peak volatility days was ETFs, which is just unheard of. So we had a 10-day, maybe even longer period of 1,000-point swings in the Dow up oh. and down, 4, 5, 6% moves every day, sometimes straight down, sometimes coming back halfway. <laughs> just, just an unbelievable period. The VIX over 80, I mean, that's about as heavy duty as it gets. How did the ETF universe hold up under the stress and strain of massive price movement and huge volume flow? Yeah, the, the only place we saw real issues were in the leverage and inverse complex. And it's not because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. It's just math gets on your math gets in the way when you have, say, triple leverage on something that moves 30 percent in a day. Right. You start testing Zeno's paradox very quickly. Um, and in fact, halfway, seen... halfway, halfway until you get right there. <laughs> right. right you never exactly. get that. And, you know, if you have a. If you have a triple leveraged oil fund and oil drops 33%, well, guess what? You should have lost 100% of your money. Um, now, what's actually happened is a bunch of these products have had to delist or close. Um, we've seen a lot of the leverage in inverse space go from being 3x product to 2x product because the volatility of the underlying has gotten nuts. So we've seen some testing of those things. It makes for great headlines. You know, ETF haters like to get snarky about, you know, anytime something closes or doesn't work perfectly. Um, but the reality is that that corner of the market, leveraged and inverse funds, it's a very small part of the market. It's uh, like last time I checked, it was under $80 billion out of a $4 trillion market um, and really just used, I, I think, appropriately by day traders. The average holding period on a leverage fund is less than a day. That's amazing. And and the underlying in those ETFs are not equities, they're futures, aren't they? Depends on which one. So the vol funds in particular, and also the oil ones, which, you know, those are definitely investing in front or second month futures, or some of the oil ones have strips. Um, and, and there's really infinite capacity in those markets. Those they really haven't had any issues in the, the big futures and options markets. We have seen, I think, in the in the heat of this, 
the issue of the pro cyclicality of the levered vol funds. Now talk about the deep end of the pool. So right. funds that are doing two or three X or minus one, two, three X, where there are no three X's left um, on VIX futures themselves. When we had spikes in the VIX that went from, you know, VIX 30 to VIX 60 instantaneously, that creates a real problem for how those funds have to reinvest at the end of the day, because when vol goes up, that means they all, whether they were long or short, they all need to buy more into the close in order to be exposed correctly for the next day. It's a spiral, isn't it? It's it, a, it is a spiral, right? It spirals up and it spirals down. So when we've had days like today and yesterday where vol's been coming down, they have to be net sellers of those VIX futures. That does have an information transfer to the options market and then theoretically to the individual equities. I've never found any evidence that you can actually mathematically prove that, but there is definitely an information transfer. If everybody knows that we have to you know, unload a ton of VIX futures into the close, obviously VIX futures prices are going to come down. People are then going to look to the options market to try to create hedges against that. So it's not, it's not zero connection, but it's certainly difficult to say IBM had a bad day because the VIX futures complex had to sell off into the close. I love the concept of you could hedge your front running on a VIX trade. That works out great. <laughs> any any um, relationship to the big blow up in VIX notes that we saw, what is that, two, three years ago already? Um, yeah, not not so much. I mean, the the problem with um, the problem with VIX itself is that VIX is inherently very volatile and uninvestable. So it makes for a particularly problematic investment. Um, you know, when we saw the collapse of some of those inverse VIX funds a few years ago, really it was the same thing. It's like we had such low VIX that, you know, these guys just couldn't handle any movement whatsoever because the number became very low, right? If you're trying to do a move from VIX at 10, well, a two-point swing is all of a sudden on a percentage basis right. enough to cause a real problem. Now we're having, you know, 40 point swings, uh, you're starting at a much different base. So volatility of volatility, is is that really something that mom and pop want to put their money into? Or is this strictly a day trader and an institutional hedge um, circumstance as opposed to something more investable? In, in the current market, I don't even think of it as being a day trader thing. I think of it as being a gambling thing, uh, right? I mean, nobody has any business pre yeah, nobody has any business predicting whether VIX at 50 is high or low based on where it's going to close today or tomorrow. I mean, that is such an enormous crapshoot. It's a bigger crapshoot than just guessing the close on the market today by a long shot because you're dealing with these pro cyclicality issues. You're dealing with the futures market. You're dealing with the opinions of options traders. Nobody has any business investing in this. It's a speculative vehicle designed to capture a certain kind of sentiment in the market. And that's really what you have to think of it as. It's a sentiment indicator that you can put money behind. So let's stick with the real core equity ETFs. Like real funds. The, the <laughs> S&P 500 Spiders, the NASDAQ 100 Qs. How did they hold up in this mess? And I saw a ton of flow and a ton of, of volume in each of those. Were they able to manage that that huge huge stress and that huge power? Yeah, I think it's fair to say absolutely perfectly. Really, um, I haven't heard a single story of a blown create, uh, you know, or somebody ending up short at the end of the day and having fails to deliver. We haven't seen any of that stuff. None of that noise has broken through. Now, some of that may be because what might have been a story, you know, six months ago isn't a story now because of the stuff we saw in the bond market. Sure. But the reality is every tape that I've run, every sort of lead that somebody has, you know, flashed me in a Bloomberg I am, um, has turned out to just basically be normal trading. So hmm. we haven't had any real disconnects. We haven't had any hiccups in the operational structures at all. Honestly, it's in some ways it's been ETF's finest hour because they've been able to absorb so much of the money that's just bled out of mutual funds. I mean, the last three weeks, we've had $300 billion come out of wow. traditional mutual funds. Wow. We've had net inflows into ETFs, which is like, I mean, when last time we talked, you know, a few months ago, we were talking about what might happen in a downturn. Right. This is exactly what we said was going right. to happen. It happens every time. And, and final question, what about discounts to NAV, discounts to net asset value? Are we seeing 
trading um, at a premium or a discount, or is that still getting arbitraged pretty quickly? On the equity side, it's getting arbed out pretty quick. Now, obviously, overall spreads in the market are wider now mm -hmm. than they were, say, in November, right? That should surprise nobody. We're in much right. faster moving markets. You're not getting every liquid security a penny wide. It might be three or four cents wide. I've seen SPY trade as high as five cents wide, which is for them, it's like a barn door. Um, but like that's a very rational response. But that's about all we've seen is we've seen some of those spreads widen out. You know, the average premium in discount in an equity fund is a couple basis points. Maybe that's gone from three or four to five or six. It really has been appropriately widening for the volatility in the market. And once again, Dave, remind us where people can find your research and writing. Sure. Easiest place, etftrends.com. There's a little section called uh, Expert Insights or on Twitter at Dave Nodding. Dave Nodding, really absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for coming by.